Hey there, folks, and welcome back. We've just concluded our unit on multivariable differential calculus, and now we're moving on to one of my favorite parts of our course, multivariable integral calculus. This section is super cool, and you can read more about it in chapter 15 of our e-textbook. So if we're going to be talking about integrating multivariable functions, it'll be helpful to think back to Calculus 2 and how you integrated single variable functions. So back in Calculus 2, you were likely introduced to integration through the following problem. You had some function f of x whose graph lived above the x-axis over some closed interval from a to b. And you wanted to know the area under that graph and above the x-axis. Oh, well, finding that area exactly sounds like it would be a really hard problem. So you probably started by estimating the area. I bet you began by taking this interval a to b and chopping it up into a bunch of tiny pieces, say x0 to x1, x1 to x2, x2 to x3, and so on. On each of these tiny sub-intervals, you estimated the area under the curve using a rectangle, right? You said, this is not going to be exact, it's just an approximation, but the area under my curve is pretty close to the area of this rectangle, and finding the area of the rectangle is much, much easier. So we get this approximation. The area under our curve is approximately the sum of these rectangular areas. Well, what are these areas? The area of the ith rectangle is going to be its height times its width. Its height is the value of the function at this left endpoint. It's f of x i minus 1. The width is simply the change in x, right? It's delta x i. And there you have it, an approximation of the area under our curve. Now I bet the next thing you noticed was that when you take more and more rectangles, the approximation of your area gets better and better and better. So if I take the limit as the number of rectangles n tends to infinity, well, this expression is no longer an approximation. This is the exact area under our curve y equals f of x. We actually give this limit a special name. We call it the definite integral of our function from a to b. And we denote it by this cool symbol, the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Okay, that's all well and good, but just look at this horrible limit. No one wants to actually compute this thing by hand when looking for their area. We need a more efficient way to evaluate this definite integral. Ah, but this brings us to the best part of the story. Because back in Calc 2, you learned about a deep connection between integrals and derivatives that will allow us to evaluate this expression. Our definite integral is given by f of b minus f of a, where this function, capital F, is an antiderivative of little f. Right? The derivative of capital F is little f. Now at this point in Calc 2, you were probably weeping on the floor because this connection between integrals and derivatives and areas and slopes is just so beautiful. In fact, it's so important, we call it the fundamental theorem of calculus. And there you go, folks, the story of integration back in Calc 2. We're now going to extend these ideas to talk about integration in Calc 3. We introduce integration in Calc 3 in much the same way. Now, instead of working with a curved line in R2, our graph is a curved surface living in R3. It lives above some two-dimensional domain R in the xy plane. And for simplicity, we're going to assume for now that that domain is a rectangle. It's obtained by taking all x values between constants a and b, and all y values between constants c and d. Now, instead of asking for the area under our curve, we're going to ask for the volume under our surface and above this region R. Oh, but calculating that volume exactly sounds like a hard problem. So again, I'm going to start with an estimation. I'm going to see if I can do the same sort of trick from Calc 2. Rather than considering this entire domain all at once, I'm going to chop it up into a bunch of tiny little pieces. I make slices in my x-axis, I make slices in my y-axis, and that gives me the rectangular grid that you see here. Now on each one of these tiny little grid rectangles, I'm going to estimate the volume below my curve using a shape whose volume I can very easily compute. So how about we use a rectangular box? On this sub-rectangle here, we could approximate the volume under our curve as the volume of this box. Now what's the volume of that box? Well, it's the box's height, which we can estimate using the value of our function at a particular point, times the area of the base. So let's write this down. 
the volume of this one box is approximately, well, the height of the box, which maybe we'll estimate using this corner point, f of x i y j, and then the area of the base. But the area of the base is the change in x times the change in y, delta x i delta y j. Okay, now that's the volume of just one box. If we want to approximate the volume under our surface, we should add up the volumes from each individual subrectangle. So we're going to add up f of x i y j delta x i delta y j. Now, of course, we have to add over every one of these rectangles. We have to sum over all of our indices i and all of our indices j. So we actually have a double sum here. The sum from i equals 1 to n, maybe that's how many cuts I've made in the x-axis, and then we have the sum from j equals 1 to m, that's the number of cuts I've made in the y-axis. This is an approximation for the volume under our surface. Well now I think you know what's coming next folks. If we make more and more cuts in our x-axis and y-axis, we get a finer and finer rectangular grid, and the volumes of these boxes give us a better and better approximation for the volume under our surface. So if I take the limit as m and n go off to infinity, this is no longer an approximation. This is the volume under our surface, and we give it a special name. We call this expression the double integral over the region r of f of x, y, d, a. The d, a term here reminds us that we're adding over a whole bunch of tiny, tiny rectangular areas. Right? Delta xi, delta yj is the area of one of these grid rectangles. Well, again, this is all well and good, but no one wants to compute this gross limit when looking for the volume. So just like in Calc 2, we're going to look for a more efficient way to compute this double integral. Okay, suppose now that I've given you a function f, and you actually want to compute this double integral. You want to know the volume under the surface z equals f of xy. How do you do it? Do you compute that nasty limit from the last slide? No way, no one wants to do that. So instead, I'm gonna show you an alternative that we actually use in practice. Start by slicing your surface using the plane y equals a constant. So maybe I slice it here. That's gonna give me a little cross section of the region under my surface and above the xy plane. Now what's the area of this cross section? Well, if you study this picture for a moment, you'll realize that we have to take the area under our curve, z equals f of x, y, where here y is again this constant, from x equals a to x equals b. Ah, but now this is starting to feel a lot more like calc 2. The area of this cross section is the integral from a to b of f of x, y, dx. Now, I know you're probably feeling a little uneasy about this y term. Why is there a y in our integral with respect to x? Oh, well, don't worry too much about that. Remember, we're treating y like a constant here, so we should pretend that it's just like any other constant when we carry out this integration. Uh, now, hold on a sec, Zach. Aren't we trying to find the volume under our surface? What does this have to do with areas? Well, let's think about it. If we can find the area of this cross section, then by adding up the areas as we move from y equals c to y equals d, that should give us the volume underneath our surface. We can add up those areas by integrating this expression from y equals c to d. So let's write this down. The volume under our surface, which again is the double integral over r of f of x y dA, can be thought of as the integral along the y-axis from y equals c to d of our area term, the integral from a to b of f of x y dx. And of course, our outer integral is written with respect to y. Now let's take a moment to appreciate what we've just shown. Before, I had no idea how to compute this double integral, or the volume under my curve, but now I see that it boils down to computing two single integrals. The first with respect to x, where we treat y as a constant, and the second with respect to y. Notice as well that this integral represents a sum of cross-sectional areas as we move along the y-axis but we could have just as well added cross-sectional areas in the x-axis. That would switch the order of integration here. What this means is that if we're integrating over a rectangle, which is the case in this video, then if I want to, I could first compute my integral with respect to y, the integral from c to d of f of x, y, dy, and then compute my integral with respect to x, the integral from a to b 
of this expression dx. Sometimes switching the order of integration like this can make your life a lot easier. We'll end this video with a quick summary of the main ideas. If we wish to know the volume under our surface, z equals f of xy, and above some region r in the xy plane, we compute the double integral over r of f of xy dA. Doing this amounts to computing two single integrals, one with respect to x and the other with respect to y. If we're integrating over a rectangle, the order of integration does not matter. Finally, to compute one of these single integrals, we integrate as normal, treating the other variable like a constant.